Hi, I'm Lindsay. And I'm Marshall. Welcome to Tumble, the show where we explore stories of science discovery. Today, we're talking about the meaning of dreams. Ooh, does this mean I get to share the weird dream I had last night? Like I was walking down the hall, but it wasn't really the hall. It was like... (laughs) No, no, no. Stop and hold on to that for a bit. Because we're going to dreamland. We'll find out how humans have found meaning in dreams for thousands of years and how science has changed that forever. All right, let's get dreaming. Today's question comes from our listener, Abby. Hi, my name is Abby. I'm eight years old. And my question is, do dreams have meanings? I think that sometimes they do. Abby even has an idea for how scientists can learn about dreams' meanings. I think that scientists can find out by doing CAT scans on people. She's not talking about putting cats on people's faces while they're sleeping, right? That sounds like a terrible idea. (laughs) She's talking about using a machine to look inside people's brains as they dream. So let's ask our listeners, what do you think? Do dreams have meanings? And how do you think scientists would find out? Think about it. We'll be right back with a neuroscientist as our guide into dreamland. All right, we got our PJs, we got our pillows, and we're ready to dream. To answer Abby's question, I called up Siddhartha Ribeiro, a Brazilian neuroscientist. He studied the science and the history of dreams. I would say that I have very personal reasons and very strong dream reasons for why I am a dream researcher. Dream reasons? What, what is a dream reason? <laughs> it's a reason that comes to you in a dream, of course. <laughs> Siddhartha told me he's made some big life decisions based on his dreams. Wow. So I I guess dreams clearly have a lot of meaning for him. But what about dreams in general? How did he answer Abby's question? I think she she gave a fantastic answer. They can have meaning. What does he mean they can have meaning? Like, what, what does that mean? And what do dreams mean? When do they mean something and when do they not? What do we mean when we say mean? Wait, wait. Stop. Let's take a deep breath. Relax. And let's begin our trip into dreamland. Where are we? And why is it so hazy around us? And what is this beautiful music that I wrote? We've traveled back in time into the history of dreamland at the very beginning of dreams. Scientists believe that dreaming evolved way before humans. Dreaming is quite old. Most mammals have some sort of dreaming. Yeah, I mean, I've seen pets dream. So like dogs that look like they're chasing squirrels while they're lying down and cats that are just like knocking things off of counters. (laughs) That's not true. (laughs) Well, scientists have actually found evidence that all kinds of creatures are probably dreamers. Other animals like birds and reptiles and the octopus and even the fruit fly can have something like the kind of sleep that we have when we have very strong dreaming. What what does a fruit fly dream about? (laughs) Just like a giant rotting peach. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) So beautiful. (laughs) Humans are the only animals that are able to share our dreams, which is how we know about dreams that were dreamed hundreds or even thousands of years ago. When we look into the literature, the books that were written in antiquity, in ancient Babylon, ancient Egypt, we'll see that dreams played a very important role in society, in private life, but also in public life. People in ancient civilizations wrote books about gods and goddesses visiting them in their dreams and telling them what to do. Yeah, I mean, in ancient stories, it seems like dreams are just like another place to ask if you should go on the quest or find out how to conquer the monster or just like learn how to do laundry or something. (laughs) Exactly. Many cultures, even today, believe that to dream is to visit a spirit world. It's an experience of going to another world that supposedly existed forever, where you can find solutions for problems and inspiration for overcoming challenges. So people thought of dreaming as being able to actually like go to another place. That's kind of incredible, like, like a magical nighttime place that we all get to go. Yes, but now it's time to travel to the age of modern science, where we'll figure out how science changed the meaning of dreams forever. 
When the scientific revolution happened in the 16th and 17th century, scientists weren't too interested in studying sleep or dreams. You mean they didn't believe in the magic of dreamland? Absolutely not. And sleep seemed really boring. People just assumed that nothing was going on while we were lying in bed for hours. But that would change. There were two moments. The first moment was at the end of the 19th century. That's when Dr. Sigmund Freud published a book called The Interpretation of Dreams. Oh, I've read that book, actually. Oh, really? Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, Freud is like the most famous psychologist of all time, and he was obsessed with dreams. Yes, psychologists are like the doctors of the mind. Freud's patients would come and visit him in his office. Often laying down over some couch or something, and they are freely remembering. They're just telling the dream and telling everything that comes to their mind. Freud believed that dreams were a window into people's wishes and fears that they didn't even know they had. So he believed dreams definitely had meaning. He would have definitely said yes to Abby's question. But other scientists were skeptical of Freud and his colleagues. The science of their time didn't like it because they thought that this was bogus and that it was not quite scientific. Yeah, I mean, he would just sort of like listen and observe his patients, but didn't really go through much of like a, a testing process. Yeah, and that's what the scientists said. They were not really measuring anything. It was more like an art of listening and making sense. They had certain rules, but the scientists at the time didn't think they were good enough. Okay, so if the most famous psychologist ever wasn't good enough, what did scientists think is good enough? Well, they wanted to see evidence, not interpretation. Data, not dream reports. So 20 years after Freud died, they got what they were looking for. Because in 1953, scientists discovered the existence of REM sleep. REM sleep? Is that when you fall asleep to the band REM? No, it stands for rapid eye movement. It was discovered by a sleep scientist who was using his eight-year-old son as a guinea pig in his sleep lab. The boy would sleep hooked up to a machine that recorded his brain waves. And a few hours into the night, his father noticed that there was a whole lot of activity going on in his son's brain and in his eyes. The eyes moved a lot, but the body was very relaxed. Right, so he was fast asleep, but his eyes were moving as he slept. Yes. During REM, your eyes go back and forth like you're watching a very fast tennis match. The sleep scientist was super surprised by this. He began to study it with other scientists. They found that everyone does this at night. They realized this was a specific sleep state that would occur at least four or five times per night. That sounds like a huge breakthrough, but like, what does REM have to do with dreaming? The discovery of REM sleep was a big step in understanding where dreams come from and when they happen. And then in 1957, pretty much the same group of researchers discovered that when you wake people up from those moments, they report dreams, you know, 80, 90 percent of the time. This study showed that dreams were happening in the brain. And this was a big thing because now there was something very concrete and very objective, something that you could measure and determine and that really satisfied the rigor of science. Well, so now that scientists had a way to measure dreaming, how did they figure out dream meanings? Like, can you measure that? Like, this dream was a 10-point meaningful. (laughs) Let's move just a few years later in dreamland, when the psychology and biology of dreaming come together. In the 1960s and 70s, a psychologist named David Folks studied dreams in children and how they change as they age. He would get the same children to come to his laboratory every year, a few days a year, for a long period, for like 10 years or more. Starting at age three, the children would sleep in the lab and then say whatever they dreamed about. Like Freud's patients would? Kind of, but without analyzing it. Folks found that preschoolers had very simple dreams about themselves or animals. But as they got older, their dreams involved more people and the stories got more complicated. 
Young children often have dreams that are more like a single scene or a few scenes. But when they become teenagers, dreams tend to become like a movie, like with many parts. So he thought that like preschooler dreams are like a page from a picture book, but teenage dreams are like a bad movie where you get to the end and you're like, what was that? (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. Folks thought that kids had to learn to dream and that dreams didn't have much meaning or complexity until they got older. But new research might change that idea. But recently, some researchers have shown if you record dreams, not in the laboratory, but if you go to the children's home to record the dreams, they are richer. They're more interesting. Huh. Well, that's really interesting. But like, why would that be? Well, sleeping and dreaming in a lab is not the same as sleeping and dreaming in your own bed. For starters, you're in an unfamiliar place. And second of all, your head is actually wired to a machine to monitor your brain waves. It's glued to your head, so it's not the most comfortable thing. Yeah, it would be hard to sleep normally with a bunch of wires glued to my head. (laughs) (laughs) That would definitely affect your dreams too, right? (laughs) I'd probably dream that there were lots of wires in my head. (laughs) (laughs) There's evidence that people's brains are actually half awake while they're sleeping in sleep labs. So now researchers are experimenting with different types of equipment that can work in homes and training parents to record their children's dream reports. And you can then revisit those experiments and like do them again, measure again, but in a more safe and comfy setting. And that tends to make dreams richer, more complex, more interesting, more meaningful. More meaningful. So so what do dreams mean? We got to get down to this. <laughs> Each dream means something different to the dreamer. But Siddhartha told me there's a general rule about when dreams have meaning. When we have a lot of expectation, this is when dreams tend to be most meaningful. In other words, when we're looking forward to something or have a big question that we're trying to answer, our dreams can help prepare us or find answers. But when we are going through like a boring part of life and nothing really new is happening, sometimes the dreams seem complete nonsense. So if we don't have anything really going on, that's when you get the weird dreams that just don't make any sense or the ones that are super mundane where you're just like having breakfast. (laughs) Right. And we know this by listening to people's dreams like Freud did, but also by using scientific tools to measure dreams like the neuroscientists who study the brain itself. So it all comes together. But how can we understand the meaning of our own dreams? Well, luckily Siddhartha is sending us off from dreamland with a guide to finding meaning in our own dreams in just three easy steps. First of all, talk about dreams before you go to sleep. Share the expectation that you may have. You can make a wish for what you'd like to dream about, like going to visit a friend or solving a problem. It could set a direction for your dream. Mm, That's super cool. Then, when you wake up, this is the most critical thing. Don't move. Stay quiet in bed and write it down. Write down everything you can remember. Once you're done, share your dream with others. And then start telling your folks what was the dream about? Tell that to different people. And then you probably will remember more details as you start telling the dreams. Friends and family may help you figure out what the dream means as you talk more and more about it. Siddhartha recommends doing these steps after every dream. It's like collecting the pieces of a puzzle. If you have many pieces, you kind of figure out the whole thing. Well, that was a pretty crazy adventure into dreamland. Now that I'm back in awake land. (laughs) I think we learned a lot on our trip through the history of dreamland. Not least of all, the fact that everyone can explore and make their own discoveries in their own dreamlands every single night. Listeners, let us know if you start keeping a dream diary like Siddhartha suggests, or if you have more questions about sleep and dreams. Send them to us at tumblepodcast at gmail.com. We'd love to hear them. Sweet dreams, everybody. Thanks today to Siddhartha Ribeiro, professor of neuroscience at the Brain Institute of the Federal University of Rio Grande do Norte. 
He's also the author of The Oracle of Night, The History and Science of Dreams, a great book for grown-ups. And also special thanks to Abby for sending in her excellent question. You can hear more from our interview with Siddhartha in our special bonus interview episode available on our ad-free Patreon feed. Just pledge $1 or more a month to listen to this and all our other bonus episodes. You can learn more about dream research, including how octopuses dream, on the blog on our website, sciencepodcastforkids.com. We'll have more free resources there. Sarah Robertson Lentz designed our episode art and edited this episode. Eric Kuhn is our engineer and mixer. I'm Lindsay Patterson, and I wrote this episode. And I'm Marshall Escamilla, and I made all of the music. Tumble is a production of Tumble Media. Thanks for listening, and stay tuned for more stories of science discovery. 